me start it. of life is there He flows in the river Soars on the summer air His love is all around you The Prince of Life is there for joining us this morning. We've got a couple of props here. The title of this talk is called The Greatest Generation of All. This represents what has been called the greatest generation, World War II generation. There's the, the globe representing the world and the baby boomers, the Beatles. Anyway, we're going to start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you give us every day. And we thank you that you prepare each generation before it comes. Each generation has a purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read you two verses. This is from Isaiah 41, verse 4. God has called forth the generations from the beginning. And this is Psalm 33, 11. He fulfills the plans of his heart from generation to generation. You know, Tom Brokaw called the World War II generation the greatest generation. When they were practically teenagers, they saved the whole world. Tony Blair, former prime minister of England, once said, the two people that will give their life for you are Jesus Christ and the American GI. After World War II, the greatest generation saw prosperity staring them in the face, and they went for it. But they forgot they had children back out. They didn't know what to do with their children. They didn't know what to do with us, the baby boomers. They didn't know how to answer our questions. In most cases, they knew the right answers, but they didn't know the why behind the answers. We wanted to know the why. They said, do what you're told. Don't rock the boat. That's just the way it is, and it's the way it's always been. We wanted to know, why do we wait until we're married? Why? Are we going to church? Why are we sending our brothers and sisters to die in Vietnam? These were all very serious and important questions that needed answers, but our parents weren't coming through. So we started looking elsewhere. The Beatles came along and captured the hearts and the imagination of our generation. We couldn't get enough of them. Other groups came right behind them. They became our spiritual leaders, so to speak. There developed a wide gap between the World War II generation and we baby boomers. I'm gonna set this over here so you can see it. A gap between we, we couldn't, it was called, we call this the generation gap. While the World War II generation went on to accomplish great things like developing aircraft and airline companies, using nuclear energy to power cities and ships and and most remarkably, developing space travel and even successfully landing astronauts on the moon. We baby boomers became disenchanted with what was happening to our generation. The Vietnam War was siphoning off a good number of us and no one had a good reason as to why. So we began to protest. We began to rebel. We had anti-war marches in Washington. There were a number of high-profile assassinations. Student protesters were shot and killed at Kent State, a small college in Ohio. It was the height 
of a Vietnam War, and it all came to head at the end of the 60s. It ended up being a cultural tectonic shift. Because of the pressure we put on Washington, the baby boomers were successful in changing the minds of the leaders, and it brought an end to the Vietnam War. Discrimination against women and blacks came to the forefront, and great strides were made towards correcting these issues. The Bible says God has called forth the generations from the beginning. He fulfills the plans of his heart from generation to generation. Each generation accomplishes a specific purpose of God. God had a specific purpose for the World War II generation in that they experienced war like the world had never seen before. And in the case of our nation, the U.S., our four parents rose to the challenge and accomplished great things. When our generation came along, we were more introspective. We were forced to reconsider things handed down to us from the World War II generation, things which needed to be changed. And we changed them. But because of the fall, the fall into sin in the Garden of Eden, each generation has its shortcomings. Even the best generations had their failings. The World War II generation didn't hand the baton to us baby boomers like they should have. So we struggled. We baby boomers struggled. We fought within ourselves to find ourselves. And God was there for us. But we had to look for him. We had to do our homework. God required our generation to be a seeking generation, to look inside ourselves, to see who we really were to realize our need for someone outside ourselves to make sense of the crazy world we live in. In the 1960s, Satan had his candy everywhere. It was here where God stepped in. On the West Coast, the Jesus Revolution started, and thousands of hippies were coming to Jesus. They realized that Christ, from Christ, they learned about from the World War II generation that their spiritually dead churches, you know, the Jesus that was taught in these churches, the one that they were experiencing in the Jesus Revolution was more than that. He was more than just religious doctrine. He was real. Jesus gives purpose and meaning to life. He had the answers to all the questions we were asking and the why behind the questions. The Jesus movement spread across the U.S. and became known as the Charismatic Movement in the Midwest and other parts of the country. It resulted in many thousands giving their hearts and lives to reading the Bible, getting to know God, and serving Jesus. God used the World War II generation <clears throat> to put a hunger in the baby boomers, to seek truth, to seek God, and to find Him. In Matthew chapters 12 and 16, Jesus taught, about the generations of his time. And this is what he said. The Pharisees... Hello? Uh-oh. I just went out. Let's see if this is... Oh, I think my battery's off. Anyway, I'll just talk a little bit louder. In Matthew chapters 12 and 16, Jesus taught about the generations of his time. And this is what he said. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up testing Jesus, and they asked him to show him a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know, you've probably heard this in another way. There's the old saying, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morn, sailors take warn." We know that saying today. This is what Jesus is referring to, this saying. Then Jesus said, you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. You cannot discern the signs of this generation. These are the religious leaders of Jesus' day questioning him. They should have known the signs Jesus was speaking about. Then Jesus said this, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. I am here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. I am here. Think about what Jesus is saying through these words to us. Jesus is reprimanding the Pharisees and religious leaders of his generation who rejected him. Jesus is saying the people of Nineveh would condemn them because they repented at the preaching of Jonah hundreds of years before. Then Jesus said the Queen of Sheba would condemn this generation because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon almost a thousand years before. If Jesus held the generation of his day responsible for what came before them, how much more are we <laughs> responsible for what has come before us, for what has been given to us? Each generation accomplishes the purpose God has designed for it to fulfill. Each generation builds on the previous generation. I'm going to read Psalm 145 verse 4. Listen to this. One generation shall praise your works to another generation and shall declare your mighty acts. In other words, if we understand that each generation builds on the previous generation and the value of one generation passes to the next, then the last generation will be an accumulation of all the generations before it. Psalm 24 and 1 Peter 2, 9, called the last generation, the chosen generation. <clears throat> as great as the World War II greatest generation was, and as introspective as the baby boomers were, each generation since has built on these two. Even though it may be hard to see now, the best is yet to come. The best generation is about to come. The final generation will be a chosen generation because God has called forth the generations from the beginning and each generation builds on the previous one. The last will be the first. The last generation will be the greatest generation of all. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He gave you freedom and the power of prayer. He waits at the altar. World War II generation. And the Beatles, the baby boomers. Whenever you hunger. Generation of all is coming. <laughs>